Now, how many of you know there's a price to win? How many of you understand there's a price to be a winner? How many of you hear that? Come with me today. I'm going to enlarge your thinking. How many of you know there's a price to pay to win? If you want to win at something, there's a price to pay. Can you hear that? If you'll come with me, I'm going to help you see something, get a bit perspective. Dwight D. Eisenhower, one of our presidents, said this, There are no victories at bargain prices. Isn't that a great statement? There are no victories at bargain prices. You can't have victory on the cheap. Are you listening? Now, how many of you know that we live, especially in America, in a culture of competitive sports galore? Everything from racing. We were there in Indianapolis. The Indianapolis 500 is coming up next week. Uh, the biggest granddaddy of all the big uh, racer, racing uh, events. And uh, you got hockey right now. Ice hockey's on the uh, deal trying to get the, uh, what's the cup called? The Stanley Cup made out of plastic. And um, then you got the NBA trying to figure their thing out. It won't be long before the pennant race will start. And then the fall classic uh, of baseball world series. And then on the heel of that will be the great football explosion into the new year of the, uh, the, uh, the Super Bowl. And you've got uh, th this summer you'll have tennis uh, the, the championships of tennis, you've got all the golf classics going on, and you've got the, the, the big, big uh, golf events. I mean, everywhere you look, there is a competitive thing going on. Is that true? Yes. And how many of you understand that in that environment, everything uh, that's there to be won, the prize, uh, is costly? And, and to win the prize, you've got to be willing to pay to win the prize. For me to take this little, uh, uh, little car I have and, and rebuild it and restore it like it was when it was first made in 1966, my wife and I did a lot of things to that car. We went back and checked the history. We went back and found where it was made in Kansas in November of 1966. We talked on the phone to people who owned the car and who saw the car and who were part of the whole uh, history of this car. It came out of a barn, this car did. came out of the largest barn sale in the history of America. And it's a $5.1 million uh, barn sale. One of the cars in the barn with ours, there were 30, but one of them was was uh, eight of them were Corvettes. One of them was a 1957 Corvette. Now, if you've ever seen a garage that should have been cleaned out about 20 years ago, this barn should have been cleaned out about 100 years ago. This man was a hoarder. And on top of these Corvettes were lawnmowers, uh, deer heads, uh, boots, uh, mud, pigeon stuff. Uh, oh my God, I've never seen anything like it. Trash like you can't imagine. And this one was pulled out and we talked to the man who got it. And, and he took it and he rebuilt it and sold it. It just sold down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for $1.5 million. It's a 1957 Airbox. They only made 47 of them. Now, why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that to show you that if you want to win the prize, it costs to win the prize. That car that was drug out from under that barn in its deplorable, horrible, rats were living inside the motor. I mean, gross, terrible, ugly. When you saw it, you would have gone, ooh, who would want that? But you see, put in the hands of the right people, that piece of junk turned into, and you know how God is. 
My wife and I are standing in this building where our car was, and there's just thousands of cars, and we're there visiting people, people coming up, looking at the car, and we're shaking hands, we're talking, doing all that. <laughs> and a guy walks up and says, oh, uh, we're, 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 tell me the story. Oh, and he says, oh, he saw a picture we had. He goes, I was in that barn. Oh, my gosh. And I'm telling the story about an air box. He said, oh, my gosh, I'm the one that rebuilt the air box. He said, your car, I saw your car. It was in the barn, too. And I just went, oh, my God, what a small world. What does it take to win? What's it going to take for you to win in life? What's it going to take for you to stop being a loser? What's it going to take for you to come above and stop just living in mediocrity and just getting by in life? How do you hear that? I went and watched uh, Christine uh, graduate as, as a lawyer. Uh, uh, I was honored. I don't know if she was, but I was to, to watch it. And we've watched her grow in some process and finish school. And, and there was a big ceremony, and I went there, and it was pretty cool watching all these young uh, troublemakers, you know. And, uh, and I was looking at them, you know, and they're all, they all dress ragged, you know, and they had on pitiful kind of, not her, she was really nice, but... Uh, <laughs> But they were all dressed, you know, just kind of low boy. You know what I'm saying? And I looked at a couple of them and I said, yeah, that won't last long. And I said, these boys have paid, these girls have paid. Somebody paid for that education. Somebody paid big money for her to be a big lawyer. I mean, you hear me now. It's like a doctor. Somebody paid a price for that doctor to be who they are. Are, are you listening to me? And, and in a, a America's culture today, we want to scratch off and get it free. Uh, we want to go buy a few of those uh, 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 lotto tickets and think that we can just skip the process and make it big. But if you read the history, 75 to 80% of the people who win those lottos either kill themselves, get divorced, go crazy, and end up broke. Hello? Have you say, Lord, I want to win? How do you want to be a winner? Come on, how do you want to win in your marriage? Win in, in life? Win in everything about you? How many of you want to be a winner? You see, some of you don't even raise your hand because you, you're just existing. And God never met, created you to just exist. You are robbing the creator from all his good intention. When God made you, he made you to be the head and not the tail. He made you to win and not lose. God didn't make accidents. If everyone doesn't pay the price to win, then everyone will pay the price by losing. Hello, listen to it good. If everyone doesn't pay the price to win, then everyone will pay the price by losing. America has a thing called the, the military. And there are young men and women that have paid the ultimate price so that we as a nation could win. Are you hearing me today? And, and your liberties that you have, our liberties that you have, are because those young boys and young girls who've lost their life, lost their legs and arms and that kind of thing. Those are young men and young women that paid a price to win. Are you listening? Everyone you look around uh, at today, and you look around uh, and you see the society we live in, everything I just mentioned, the NBA, the, all the sporting events, every one of them is a glaring picture that the church must look at. That's God's church. Must model itself if we're going to fulfill God's great commission on the earth, we must look at what it takes to win. Because the church is not willing to do the push-ups. 
The church is not willing today to lift the heavy weights, to go into the training, to discipline itself, to push away from the table and eat certain foods, uh, to stay in shape. The church is not really ready to win. The church is only ready to complain. And many of you sitting here, you sit here and you want someone to be the hero while you do nothing. That's why our our sporting events are sad. We have 100,000 people sitting in the the stands that need exercise and you'll have 22 on the field that need a break. (laughs) Hello? Too many hot dogs and too much other, you know, cheer them on, go boys. The church has fallen uh, into this trap that it just comes uh, to exist. It doesn't come uh, to win. And I'm I'm a person driven. I'm driven by passion. I'm passionate about life. Uh, I'm passionate about food. When I eat food, I want it with flavor. I like salsa. I like, you know, the Africans eat it, you know, and they think they're eating it hot. (laughs) All I got to do is get my Indians to come over and put some food on the table. Yeah, then we can deal. If that ain't good enough, I'll go to Indonesia and bring some of them peppers. Man, I like food with sauce. I like food that's, that's got something in it. I like life. Come on. I don't like to go to the fish market. I like to go out in the water and command the fish to get in my boat. I told you I was preaching on Wednesday. I am. To the water. I'll stand on the side of my boat and I'll command it to say, get out of the water and get my boat. And you know what? I have authority. Those fish get in my boat. How many of you hear what I'm saying? I don't want to lose. I was a loser as a druggie. I was tired of being a loser. I want to be a winner. How many want to be a winner? How many want to join a winning team? How many want to say to Baltimore, come on, Baltimore, stop complaining. Stop looking at what you don't have and get up and believe what you could have and make the choices to be a winner and not a loser. It's not based on your color. It's not based on your education. It's not based on any of those lies. It's based on a solid core commitment of choice. If you choose to live life, you can live it. You want a marriage that's good? Choose to make that marriage good. You want children to, to, in the house to obey your rules while they're there? Choose to tell them they ain't got no choice. Hello? I didn't raise angels, but I guarantee you, except for the, when they lied and cheated and snuck behind my back, in my house, in my presence, <laughs> they did not. Come on. And I have a hope that when you raise them up in the way they should go, when they get old, I might be dead in my grave, but before they die, I guarantee you that my prayer will come to pass. Because I'm a, not a child of a loser, I'm a child of a winner. Now, in the world's picture, again, remember, you got this glaring picture. And and, and in the world, it's a glaring picture of teamwork. The church world, it's the kingdom of God. In the world, how many of you know there are no individual athletes? Michael Jordan was no good without the rest of the boys on the team. Any car racer that wins a a race, there was somebody working on the car and somebody owned the car and somebody designed the car, et cetera, et cetera. Can you hear that? In the world, it's NBA players uh, and all that, the hockey players and the baseballs and the footballs and all that. There's somebody behind the process making it a team thing. Then you and I need to see this team spirit in business. 
It's amazing how a couple of guys could get everyone to wear what's now referred to in the paint department as Home Depot Orange. It has its own name. In the paint departments of the world, it's called Home Depot Orange. Because it's an automatic identification. If you see that orange, you know that's Home Depot Orange. Come on. The airlines, the food industry, the, 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 uh, they're, they're all part of the team concept that you wear the colors, uh, you speak the same language, uh, you push the product. When we were at this uh, car show the other day, the Chevrolet, the Ford guys, you know, the Chevrolet guys won't talk to the Ford guys and vice versa. I mean, it's like, you know, they got Ford hats on, they got Ford shirts on, and then they got the guys over here. I talked to an old fella, he had four Corvettes and, 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 and one Chevelle, and I said, uh, uh, I, obviously, you like uh, Chevrolet, and you, God, he stiffened up, he said, I, what? Yeah, I'm Chevrolet. And I was like, okay. I mean, I wasn't about, I took, I took this little car of mine to a place called a dyno test where they tested on a machine by running the back wheels as fast as the car will go and they can tell you how much horsepower it has and how fast it will go. And it didn't move anywhere. It just sat right there like a lot of us. And it just, just sat right there and ran right in place. And it showed all the potential the car had and didn't go anywhere. But when I went in the shop, it was nothing but Mustangs. Black ones, gold ones, striped ones. They were there with parachutes on the back. 1,100 horsepower, 1,200 horsepower, 1,500 horsepower. And I drive my little red car, convertible in there. It's a Chevrolet. And I drive this little Chevrolet red car. Oh, it's prettier than that. And I drive, I drive this little red car right up in there. And all these guys are standing there like, what do we do? This is a, this is a Mustang. And I went over to this one guy, big bruiser, tattooed everywhere. And he's just looking at my little red car. And I said, Y'all need some sweet lipstick in this place, man. I said, you got all these rough guys in here with all this. You need, and they laughed. They took that thing, went through the process, tested that thing, and, and they had a blast with it. I, and, but yet, man, everywhere you look was Ford emblems. How many of you know when you go to Home Depot, everybody's got orange? When you go to McDonald's, they all got the little arches. How many of you know there's something about the logo buying into the team? We see it in the audio, auto industry. And, and, and as I shared with you, there's, uh, there's all kinds of guys that are in Ferrari guys. And then there's the Porsche guys. And then there's the Shelby Cobra guys and on and on and on. They wear the clothes, the language, definitely know the product. They know everything about it. And some of you ladies, you could go there with your certain, my wife can look at a dress and say, oh, I know who made that. And I'm looking at her and say, what are you talking about? And, and makeup, how many of you know, y'all go there and they, you know all the brands and all the who makes the kind that makes your wrinkles disappear. <laughs> Come on. And, and, and when you're in, you're in that lane, you, no, we don't, I don't use that product. This is what I use. You got it all figured out. Huh. And this, there was this particular car that I mentioned to you at the auction and they had, this auctioneer was t talking to me about it. And we, my wife and I, and we got talking and they have 200 employees that work for this guy that sells these cars. It was amazing how sold out they were for their job, their vision, the pride. I mean, everywhere you turn, they would be right there. Yes, sir, can I help you? Sure, uh, let me open that. Let me help you with this. Oh, they, 200 employees. How do you know? I ran something one time with 200 employees. It's like herding cats. The only thing that brings us together, listen good now, is as people is Jesus Christ. The only thing that brings us together, come on, it made me look at the church saints while I was watching this whole thing happen. I, I kept seeing the church and I said, Lord, where's the church uh, that believes in itself and believes in its uh, collective togetherness and, and believes that it's part of something and is proud that it's part of something? 
See, these people were proud that they owned Fords, proud that they owned Chevrolet, proud that they own a Ferrari or whatever. And I'm looking at the church going, where's the pride? Where's that, that thing that says, yeah, I go to church. I go to this church and I go, I'm a part of and I'm connected to. I'm a member of. I belong to. Man, we got the best thing going. We got this going and that going. What happened? Yes. They're pushing cars, cosmetics, tennis shoes. And we can't push the kingdom. Come on, bitch. Our message is Matthew 10, 7. And as you go preaching, Jesus said, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How many know the kingdom of heaven has got to be at hand? Paul obeyed Jesus' command in Acts 28, 30, 31. It says, look at it. It says in verse 31, preach to them the kingdom of God and teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness and quite openly and without being molested or hindered. Paul said, man, you got to preach the kingdom, teach the kingdom, talk about it with boldness and openly. Come on, saints. I'm I'm bothered when when the automobile guys will push their car at any expense and to get one of God's people to mention Jesus is almost like pulling teeth. And these guys, man, they all got their, 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 their polo shirts on, you know, with the name on it. And who are you? Well, we're this and this car restoration, and we're this and this part. There was a guy that my wife and I met that owned a, a, a car detailing spray. It's a wax light, and you spray it on, wipe it right off, and it shines the car. And he's a young guy, and he did a little work for me on my car. And he, just, he was just out there running around. He had a bunch of guys working, and they all had their shirts on. And as soon as we'd run into them, they'd go like this. They'd say, see, this is who I am. This, I'm a part of that. And I'm going, where's the church? Where's the church that says, hold it, hold it. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Like my friend that's out of Texas is coming on an airplane, uh, United Airlines going to uh, Washington, D.C. And it was the farmer's uh, 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 thing rally, big farmer's rally. They were going to have a million farmers come to D.C. And he's on this plane and the plane ran into air turbulence and turned sideways and stuff started flying around and the plane shook and went down and dropped about a thousand feet. And when it was dropping, he put his back on first class up against the, the, the wall of the, uh, where his seat was and he's just let the pressure holding him there. And he starts saying, this plane could crash. Do you know Jesus? He said them old farmers were trying to get on their knees. They were coming out of their seat belts. They were bowing over. Hats were flying. They were screaming out, Jesus, help me. The old farmer hands were in the air. And that plane shook and the stewardess couldn't get out of her seat. She said, sir, sit down. He said, I can't and you can't make me. Jesus is on this plane. You need to get right with Jesus. Amen. Finally, the plane leveled off and settled down. And they came and they got all over him. And at the end of the thing, when everybody stood up, everybody was quiet as a church mouse when they got in D.C. And he turned around and was looking. He stood up and he yelled, all of you, let's give God grace and give God thanks right now. Bow your heads. And everybody on the plane just prayed with him. He turned to the steward. She said, you're a troublemaker. He said, I'm getting off. Thank you. (laughs) Come on, saints. You see, there's something wrong when they love Mickey Mouse and they're willing to put on all them costumes and look like a nut. When you go to these ballparks and these guys dress up in these these, uh, bird suits and, and all them other kind of suits and they're willing to be a freak for that. And yet, where are we? Come on, saints. Listen to this. I'm gonna finish. Mm. Paul was one of the best team players there was in the New Testament. Are we as serious about our passion and our product and our agenda as he was, or they are? Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add everything you need to it. 
A mindset is a fixed mental attitude and a disposition that is, is responsible for our responses to the situations we face. Proverbs 23, 7, we are a product of what we think about most. We are a product of what we think about most. When we begin to have a kingdom mindset, we begin to be conscious of the fact that God is our ruler and he has a plan for us. As representatives of the kingdom of God, we should impact people everywhere we go. Come on, saints. The belief that one person can do something great is a myth. Even the Long Ranger had Tonto. Hello? White Earp had two brothers. Even the aviator Charles Lindbergh had, seven, had nine businessmen that backed him and paid for the plane. How many of you know, saints, there are no individuals. There's never an individual who did it by themselves. We need to understand that by the grace of God, it is a group thing that God has made up. How many of you hear me today? Even Einstein, with all of his relativity theories and all of that, listen to what he said this. He, he said something so profound. Many times a day, I realize how much my own outer and inner life is built upon the labors of many fellow men, both living and dead, and how earnestly I must examine myself in order to give return as much as I have received. Einstein realized, saints, that if it wasn't for somebody else going before them. How many of you know that in life, it is that the journey will leave us in a position where one day those in front of us will be gone. Come on. And what are we doing with the Christianity that we have? Are we carrying the badge? Are we really out there sharing the fact that I belong to a great church? I go to Rock City Church. Are we sharing that? Are we ashamed of the gospel? Are we ashamed of who we are? Are we ashamed to open up and confess that God is the Lord and King of our life? When you go everywhere, how many of you know when you go everywhere you go, if it's a product push situation, they're selling. If you go to Wendy's today, they ain't talking McDonald's. Hello? And if you work at Home Depot, Depot, you better not come in with a blue apron. Are you listening? Here's a Chinese proverb. Behind an able man, behind an able man, there are always other able men. Amen. Here's what Lyndon Johnson said. There are no problems we cannot solve together and very few that we can solve by ourselves. Here's an old saying when it comes to teams. Either we're pulling together or we'll be pulling apart. I love what Chuck Swindoll, great preacher and orator and teacher, he wrote this down. I copied his note. Wrote these words, nobody is a whole team. We need each other. You need someone and someone needs you. Isolated islands, we're not. To make things, to make this thing called life work, we got to learn and got to support. And relate and respond. Give and take. Confess and forgive and reach out and embrace and rely on. Since none of us is a whole, independent, self-sufficient, super capable, all-powerful hotshot, let's quit acting like we are. Life's lonely enough without overplaying, uh, without our overplaying that silly role. The game is over. Let's link up. The book of Acts probably is the best way to end this today. Chapter 2, verse 46. They were continuing daily in one accord in the temple. Acts 2, 1 says they were all with one accord. 
How many you know it's, it's today's independent spirit that I have my own, I am my own man, my own person, and we go off into our own world and we're no longer a cohesive thing. Yet the people who win, look what's in front of us, baseball. Does anybody think one player can win the game? How about the NBA? Can any one player win the game? If Michael Jordan was on the team, did the whole team have to play? Yes. Look, LeBron's got to play with the Cavs, the Cavs if the whole thing's going to work. Come on, but everybody's got to be on the team because he can't shoot it, dribble it, run it down, and everything else. Come on. And how many of us think about the church? We look at the church and we say, well, I hope they're there. I hope they do their part. I hope they're paying attention. We, we say, well, I don't need to go today. I'll just stay home. I don't need to do that because I'm not needed. Jesus. You're part of the team. Right. Look, when I played sports, my coach used to tell me in, in little kid sport, he would tell me, he'd tell all the parents, you make sure, because I think we only had, if we're required to have nine, I think we had like 10 players or something close. And he would tell them. You got to be here. You make sure you're here, son. You got to be at the field because it meant they forfeited the game. How many of you know they don't forfeit the game when all the players are there? It's they forfeit the game when one player don't show up. How many of you know this is a team sport? And you and I can sit back and say, well, they'll pay for it. Oh, well, they'll do it. They'll lead the worship. They'll do the ushering. I'll just go and I'll just be a part. I'm sorry. That's not what the scripture says. They were saying the same thing. They believed the same thing. They were wearing the same shirts the disciples were, except theirs was red because it had blood on it. 1 Corinthians 3.9 says, For we are all fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together with and for God. You are God's garden, his vineyard, his field under cultivation, and you are God's building. Amen. I want you to go to Psalm 84, please. Put it on the screen. I, I must read this to you. How many of you are listening today? Amen. Remember my statement in the beginning. If everyone doesn't pay the price to win, then everyone will pay the price by losing. How many of you hear that? Amen. That's why churches are closed today. That's why thousands of churches in America are shutting their doors and they're closing. Go downtown in Baltimore, 1,300 churches. Look how many of them have shut down and closed their doors. Why? Because people decided I'm not on the team. And because I'm not on the team, it don't matter. How many of you know, saints, Christianity had better catch the spirit that the world's got, and that is this. They know how to be a team. Amen. When those guys were pushing Man, the Corvette guys, they were crawling under my car, lights on there, flashlights, they were looking, they were checking, sliding their hands inside the cracks. They were looking at every little single detail. I mean, it's, it's like a beauty contest. And they're marveling and looking, stepping back, and they're checking this, and they pulled this, and they did this, and they stepped back, and they pulled this, and, and I'm going, man, careful with her. I mean, they're beating on my car. Because, see, they know what it takes to win. How many of you know they're hired to make sure that you can win the prize? Are you listening to me today? And the Holy Ghost comes, and he looks into you and I, and he comes to critique us and adjust us and work on us so that we can win the prize, so that we can be the witness that God wants us to be. He comes and puts that joy inside of us. Yeah so that that joy becomes contagious. Uh, he comes to bring peace to us so that we have peace uh, the world does not have. Amen. He comes to give us life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And life more abundant. Yes. Psalm 84. To the chief musician set to a Philistine lute, 
or possibly a particular Gitti tune, a psalm of the son of Korah. How lovely are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Look at it. My soul yearns, yes, even pines, and is homesick for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out and sing for joy to the living God. Yes, the sparrow, look at this, has a, found a house and a swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied are those who dwell in your house and in your presence. They will be singing your praises all the day long. Salah, pause and calmly think on that. And then verse 10, verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather be a doorkeeper and stand in the threshold in the house of my God than to dwell at ease in the tents of the wicked. Can I tell you this? The prize must be paid, the price must be paid by all and paid all the time. And it never decreases. It only increases if you want to win. You have to learn to see the big picture. If you think you're the entire picture, you'll never see the big picture. If you think you're the entire picture, you'll never see the big picture. To drive all these cars and put them inside of this barn, I mean in this, uh, uh, what was it, a... uh, State Farm's house, you know, for auctions and things. I mean, it's massive. One of the things that happened was they hired a local group called the Corvette Club of Indianapolis. And there were ladies in there that were 70, 65, 68, and they all had been Corvette owners. And they were amazing, guys and girls. And a young man drove my car from one staging building to the next, and that was quite a bit of distance. And when he got out of it, he walked away, and I, I wasn't right there. I was talking to somebody, and I came back over, and he came back down, and he said, I just want to tell you, that is the sweetest driving car. And I just thanked him. I said, wow, that was very nice of you, young man. You didn't have to do that. Uh, you didn't have to come back. He said, no, I've driven that big Cobra. I drove that SS Chevelle over there. I drove that, you know, truck over there. He said, this thing was sweet to drive. And, you know, I just thought, I said, there's a kid. He said, I get to drive the best of the best. He said, I'm in my glory. And he was talking cars. And I know enough that I can talk to cars. So I'm talking and talking. This old lady comes up. She said, I get to drive your car through. I said, well, when you get up there, make sure you give a little gas. Make her talk. And she said, oh, I love it. And she got in and, and she had to slide the seat. And she said, oh, oh. And then she moved a little and she got where she could reach the clutch. And uh, I talked to her. She said, I love doing this. And you know, saints, the whole time I'm standing there and I'm watching old women, young boys, young girls, young men, older men, older women. I'm watching people with money, with no money. But I'm watching them all excited about cars and we all know they're nothing but steel and plastic that ends up in a junkyard somewhere if not a trophy case that they can't drive it's just a car but how committed were they to what they were passionate about do you understand me today and then I look at the church and the church is like Oh, I have to go to church. And oh, we have to do this. And uh, what do you do? Oh, I, uh, you know, do you go to church? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Where do you go to church? Oh, it's house. <laughs> what are you into? Man. Yeah. Look at that car. I mean, these guys... I'm not kidding you. My wife's here. These guys were handling my car like it was, I don't know, like it was a 
piece of art. I mean, they were were all underneath of it, down in the motor, and they were looking at this thing and that thing, and they were testing this and popping this and opening the doors and watching how they close and checking the cracks. And and I'm going, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just a car. They were in love with what they do. Here they were selling, I'll give this, I'll give that, I'll give a hundred, I'll give two hundred, three hundred thousand, four hundred, a million, I'll give two million, I'll give. And I'm going, oh my God. And then here's the church. Let's raise some money for a can can make a difference so we can feed thousands of people in Baltimore who don't have any food. Can I have five dollars? Would you donate $10 so people could eat? Well, I don't know. Let me pray about it. Something wrong. Am I making my point today? You see, I can't preach anything but what I live. And I live in the life of the real world. And when I see stuff like that, it breaks my heart. When I see people so passionate, Antonio, I wanted to weep. They'd rather sell Amway than share Jesus. They'd rather sell their Mustang than talk about Jesus. And then I look at the church, and we'd rather go to Applebee's than to give a $5 donation so that somebody next week got to eat a good meal. I'm not going to church while I'm tired. Jesus, forgive us for being so cold. The big picture for us is the kingdom. Forgive us, Lord, for being so cold, so calloused, that coming to church becomes, oh, well, stand your feet. I want to pray for you, so before you go through all your gymnastics, focus for a minute. Look at me. How many of you know that I don't get my messages just out of some theoretical religious book? I have to see life. I have to see what's real in life. When I shared with you about people stealing from the church, that's so real. When I see people that come into church, it ought to be a joy. Come on. I know what I I, I watch. I watch people, where are we going? Oh, we're going to dinner, oh. Oh, we're going to Disney World, wow. We're going to church. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate some of you are, but you understand my point. I saw 100,000 people excited about cars. Oh, I appreciate them. They were, they were pieces of art, beautiful, loud. Some were so loud you couldn't talk. Some were so fast, they'd take your breath away. 275 miles an hour, 260 miles an hour, 250 miles an hour, zero to 60 in 3.1. Cars called Hellcats. 770 or 707 horsepower fast as it could be zero to 60 in almost two seconds that's one two 60 miles an hour and you see a man they're all talking wow 
Lord, bring that joy back into us to want to be in his house and his presence. Psalm 84 said, verse 10, verse uh, 3, it says, want to be in his house and his presence. How many of you say with me today, maybe the Lord needs to restore the joy of your own salvation? Could you ask the Lord that? Would you mind asking the Lord, God, uh, make me happy again. Make me happy about you and about your presence. May I be delighted to be in your presence. You know, I see young men when they get married, they get excited. I see young girls, they get married. Oh, they get excited. I see young babies. Oh, they're having better excited. I see uh, all these things. I see couples looking. Oh, they look. Can we begin to say, Lord, make me, make me excited about you. Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now. Release, God, in this room, Lord, a new passion, a new joy, a fresh uh, awakening, God, uh, in our mind and our heart that, God, if the world's excited about cars and Disney World and, and football and baseball and ice hockey and all the other, God, could we somehow begin to be excited about the kingdom of God, about the joy of the Lord, about being in your presence, about witnessing, about sharing your goodness. Lord, may that joy overtake us. May it overtake us. May it break off every religious spirit, every demonic force. In Jesus' name, I come against those demons that would surround and strangle you and rob you of that joy, of that joy, of that joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Where the presence of the Lord is, there's liberty, liberty. Where the presence of the Lord is, there's liberty. Are you free today? Are you happy today? Are you excited today about Jesus? Not my words, about Jesus. Is he anything to you? Is he everything to you? Is he anything to you? Is he everything to you? Is he Alpha, Omega, beginning, the end? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of your highest praise? Of your highest praise? Is he worthy today? Is he worthy today? Is he worthy today? Come on, come on. Sing to the Lord.
love your name, Lord. Oh, we love your name, Lord. 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 Oh, we love your name, Lord. We love your name, Lord. We love your name, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and allow your love to come inside. Allow that passionate love to come inside. That hunger that says, I can't live without Jesus. I can't live without Jesus in my life. I'm no good without Jesus. I can't do it without Jesus. I need Jesus every day of my life. I need Jesus in the morning. I need him at nighttime. I need him at noon. I need him in my job. I need him in my family. I need him in my work. I need him in every area of my life. Jesus, I need you to be everything, every day, every minute. You're the Alpha. You're the Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're everything, God. You're everything. Without you, God. Without you, I could do nothing. I need my brother. I need my sister. Lord, I want to be a team player today. I want to be on the team, a part of the team. I want to be a significant part of the team, oh God. May I stop looking at myself so I can see the bigger picture. Father, in Jesus' name, cause us to come back to that love place, that place that is only going to be satisfied with you, Lord, only with you. Shopping won't do it. Buying new cars won't do it. A new house won't do it. The only thing that satisfies is Jesus. Oh, I saw men with millions and they can't be satisfied. I'm so glad today that it's not in money. It's in Jesus. He satisfies the longing of our soul. No matter what you do to make means, make wealth, make money, it's all good, that's fine. But it can never replace Jesus. It can never satisfy like Jesus can. Heads bowed and please no one moving around for a second. If you don't know the Lord today, if you're really not walking with the Lord, you're not right with the Lord in some way, you backslid, I want to pray for you right now. All you need to do is slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. Right where you're standing. Yes, ma'am. I need Jesus today. If that's you, put your hand up. Anybody else? Hold it up and say, it's me. I need to get my life back with God. Anybody else while we're praying, just hold your hand up there a minute so I can see it. If you just say, it's me, Pastor. I need Jesus today. I need him in my life. Anybody at all? Anybody else? Those of you with your hands up, come down right now so we can pray for you. Come quickly. Come quickly so we can pray. Come right here, Lori. I'll pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, that hand went up so fast. I thank you for that touch. Lord, here's another one coming now. I thank you for her. Lord, I thank you right now. In Jesus' name, darling, there you go. Father, bless them today. May this be a life-changing moment for them. Lord, we do not take it lightly, Lord. One soul comes into the kingdom. The Bible says the angels stand up and rejoice. Could we join the angels today and rejoice? Turn to somebody. I don't want you to tell them, Jesus is wonderful to me. Come on. 
Use those words. Tell them, say, Jesus is wonderful to me. You got to use the words now. A smile and a handshake ain't what I said. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. Come on, let's sing it again. Beautiful. 